those who accompanied the emperor. On the morning of August 6th, the North Umberland was sighted by the Bellerophon. The entire squadron directed its course towards the coast and anchored to the west of Berryhead. It was deserted here and there. Was no fear of being disturbed or of the English seeing the ghost of the law arise from the sea? Until then, in spite of the pretense of giving Napoleon the title of general, such had been so since July 31st, and only it appeared in the letter of Lord Melville revealed by Lord Keith, the emperor remained emperor to the officers and crew of the Balrifan and to Keith alike. He was the guest of England. Now the farce is over, and he is their prisoner. Keith instructed Maitland to relieve the French, whatever their rank, of all their arms of every kind aboard this ship, he commanded. But on the morning of the 7th, Keith changed his mind. That was really going too far. So when the general left the vessel, he would enjoy this privilege. His sword would not be taken from him, but only from the other Frenchmen. Maitland should inspect the effects of the general and examine his furniture and books. He should take possession of money, diamonds, and negotiable notes, not to claim ownership of them, but to undertake their administration and to apply to his necessities the interest or the principal according to the amount of the sum. He should allow to accompany him only those who voluntarily followed him and only after they had been informed that they would be subject to all the regulations considered necessary to the security of the general's person. The general will be informed that if he attempts to escape, he may incur imprisonment, as will any one of his suite discover abetting his escape. Every letter he writes or is written to him, as well as those of his suite, will be forwarded to the admiral or the governor for their examination, and all communications from him containing his wishes or official requests will be left unsealed so that the governor or the admiral may add what remarks they think proper. Such was the routine prepared for the prisoner of state, England, who conceived the terror of the hulks for sailors and soldiers whom the results of battle or the fortunes of the sea delivered into his hands could not fail to conceive particularly courageous restrictions for him whom the cunning of its officers had enticed under the British flag. Nevertheless, those who accompanied the emperor were duly warned, legally or illegally, those in power laid restrictions upon their king, but they had to make them known. The English did not neglect that. They posted up the prison rules and allowed the prisoners to break them at their cost. Up until the time the emperor left the Bellerophon, as it were a parting act of decency, they continued to pay their respects to him as a guest, either so that Maitland might in this manner attempt to evade his disloyalty, or so that the whole affair might take on a farcical aspect. At the moment he was getting ready to leave, the emperor received their courtesy for the last time with the guard under arms and the drum rolling three times. Officers hat in hand, the crew were assembled in the waist and lined up on the forecastle, calmer and more confident than those who were handing him over. Napoleon surveyed their ranks, saluted the officers and seamen, and then descended into the barge, where he conversed with Lord Keith without betraying any sign of emotion or anxiety on the North Umberland, which he boarded at two o'clock. The guard was mustered, and officers stood bareheaded as before, but this was not for General Buonaparte, but for Lord George Keith Elphinstone, Baron Keith of Stonehaven, Mariscal in Ireland, Viscount Keith, GCB and Admiral, in the presence of the general, the officers always ostentatiously remained covered, and when they spoke to him, they never failed to address him as General Rear Admiral Sir George Cockburn, who commanded the squadron, did not even offer him a room in the rear. He gave him for a crossing, which was to take 71 days from August 7th until October 17th, a cabin, one cabin measuring nine feet by 12. The table was worse. The rear admiral prescribed his hours, his menus, his habits, and his table. Sir George Cockburn conducted his etiquette 
However, those of his companions not authorized to follow him were allowed to say goodbye. General Savary, the Duke de Rivigo, and Lallemont Sr., Schultz, Plenat, Resigny, Captain Piankowski, Lieutenant Mercer, Second Lieutenant Otrick, and Rivier, and the footman St. Catherine. Of all the zeal displayed at Malmaison, these were all who came to Spithead. Not General Labrador Air, who was to forfeit his life to his love for his young wife, nor Colonels Bayon or Deschamps, who by serving the palace as quartermasters retained this rank, a notorious promotion since they began as lieutenants in the picked constabulary, nor Captains Moran, St. Jan, St. Jacques, or the officers in the last campaign, nor Secretary Rathery, whose wife nevertheless accepted a pension from the Emperor, carried away by their enthusiasm in Paris. They had been much in evidence to obtain passports. They had all received them, but not one returned to him. There were only these ten men to follow the Emperor, fifteen with Bertrand, Montsalon, Gorgo, and the Tulis Casas the majority gave their allegiance from necessity, some because they had been outlawed by the Bourbons, others, not knowing where to hide, rallied in desperation to the side of the royal waif. But very few accompanied him out of pure disinterested loyalty. That was why the party of the emperor, these men, savored of the tragic. Their last chance of greeting eluded them and the selection of companions which the emperor had been obliged to make under the authority of the English government had proved the condemnation of the others, notwithstanding that it was so necessary. Of the fifteen aboard the Bellerophon, the English allowed only three, afterwards five, to accompany him, and they expressly named General Savary and Lallemand to be excluded. Since July 24, the latter had been put on the first list of candidates for banishment by the Bourbons, that of traitors awaiting summons to appear before the proper councils of war in their respective military divisions. That coincided with the English view that these two notorious criminals, as Lord Castlereagh wrote, should not be allowed to evade royal punishment by accompanying Buonaparte. We did it, Lord Bathurst wrote on August 25th, because we thought we ought. If the opportunity presented itself to hand them over to the French government, would they have the opportunity? According to the treatment meted out to himself, the emperor must have been very apprehensive about them. But was the main object not fulfilled as soon as Napoleon was on the way to his prison? Thenceforward, faced by unimportant people, the British government would be able to claim its reputation for hospitality with the zeal of men who knew that if delivered up to the scaffold would claim them. Savary and Lallemand asserted that they had gone aboard the Bellerophon only on the commander's formal promise that they would find an inviolable asylum under the English flag harassed to the utmost and charged upon his honor to tell the truth Maitland wrote to Lord Melville a letter which gave substantial foundation to this declaration though not definitely confirming it to admit the promise made to Savary and Lallemand made it appear more likely that Maitland had said nothing to the emperor less causes asserted but Maitland denied that this letter was so it is of little importance anyway with Savary and Lallemand such group of could arise, and after they had been several months in prison at Malta, the British government granted the two generals and the officers who had accompanied them a perilous freedom. But who was there then in the ministry who had not on his conscience a broken promise to Napoleon? Laliman could have been of certain use to the emperor during his captivity, for he had been devoted to him. During the fourth volume year, certainly his antecedents and his education had not prepared him for a post at court, but he was one of those, how uncommon they were, who remained loyal to the end. Savary, too, would no doubt have been a desirable companion because he was not wanting in courage nor lacking in education. He came from a military family and had received a liberal education since Marengo. He had been attached to Napoleon's person and had been overwhelmed with ranks, titles, and distinctions since 1820. 
while his loyalty had been questionable, and in 1815 no further illusions could be entertained concerning his devotion if he accompanied the emperor on board the Bellerophon. It was because he dreaded the hatred of Fouché and banishment. He had no intention of accompanying him for any other purpose. Even before he had been informed of the English ban upon him, he wrote to Lord Keith that the voyage to St. Helena did not enter into his calculations, but at the same time he shuddered at the thought that the English could hand him up to Louis the Eighteenth, and even from the Bellerophon from his cabin near that of the Emperor, he wrote letter after letter. As many to people he knew, as to people he did not bury, Lafitte, the Polignacs, the parents of Madame Duchesse de Ravigo, who, nay, Faudois Barbazon, had married the best man in the new court, he sought the assistance of his former comrades, now supporters of the Bourbons, for whose revolutionary tendencies care was taken to upbraid them. He implored the whole world. I have been notified here, he wrote to Lafitte, that I must be transferred to France. I refuse to believe it because that would be to assassinate me without cause or justice or advantage. You know perfectly well. What was it that Lafitte, who had refused to count in so many questionable theories, knew so well? Those two whom the English excluded might have been useful to the emperor, for they knew him. As for the others who found themselves removed, he had scarcely seen them. Planat and Resigny had, before 1815, been aides to camp to Generals Drouot and Lebrun, and had, during the campaigns, done similar duty to that of orderly officers in 1815. They were appointed orderly officers, but they were both sent on a mission to the south and did not rejoin him until after Waterloo. The emperor, however, regarded Planet with esteem and had selected him to accompany him. He must often have regretted it, and Planet, for his part, unceasingly desired to rejoin his master, but he was the only one. He had nothing to do with raising ye a brave man, but a fool, nor the Schultz, an intrepid and attached Pole, who had served him since 1783, at first in his own country, then in Turkey, then in the Italo-Polish Legion, and in the Lancers at the Vistula, who from 1809 to 1813 was a British prisoner, and who was captain in a detachment of light horse, accompanied him to the Isle of Elba. Still less was he concerned about Piankowski and adventurer whose mysterious life was constantly under suspicion or about lieutenant Mercer, who came from saint germain in january 1813 and left his regiment to serve the emperor without anyone knowing who had given him permission or about lieutenant otrick Mathieu marius nephew of brave general de michel whom baroness de michel had brought and introduced to the emperor dean or about Riviere, who, with the first two starts, had taken nine years to win his epaulets despite a bullet wound at Eilau, and a sword thrust at Vagram, and whom General Monsalon had inexplicably requested as aide-de-camp in June 1815. And that was all. Such was the staff the emperor had appointed after the tide of disaster had overtaken him. Two banished generals, one of whom refused to accompany him. Two French captains, two Polish captains, three lieutenants, two of whom were of one year's service. What wretchedness! The Bertrands. Would those who were going to accompany him be able at least to furnish him with the comfort necessary to his taste, to keep his mind occupied, to provide recreation to his enforced idleness to soothe his shattered nerves to maintain society for him except at Elba where however he was not idle for a day what with audiences and visits he had never experienced the weight of hours carried away as he was by the uh, illimitable scope of his plans by the fulfillment of tasks for which the day and the night were not enough by military and civil duties by a life in which to judge by his works and plans he looked upon Upon years, as the ordinary man regarded centuries, but at the moment he needed a following, something to occupy his mind, someone to remove the stones from his past, so that without civility or baseness, a court might be constituted for him. Who then were the four men who were going to live with him? Did he choose them, or were they thrust upon him? As soon as they began to offer their services, there was one concerning whom there was never any question. General Capitran, 
general, grand marshal of the past, Bertrand is henceforth identified with my fate. He has become historical, Napoleon said of him. He was a little man, bald and thin, not much of a personality, a good engineer and indifferent general, but not lacking in courage of unquestionable honesty, of quick understanding, of unconquerable obstinacy, and of the best moral character belonging to the middle class family of Barry, to a class aspiring to nobility and already living as such. He was destined for a civil engineer when the revolution broke out on September 11, 1793. He entered the School of Military Engineers as a sub-lieutenant pupil. Soon afterwards, he was identified with the Army of Sever Immers, attached at first to the Central School of Public Works, and then sent on a mission to Constantinople. In May 1797, he joined the Army of Italy and later went as a captain to Egypt with Napoleon. He had then been three years a captain from this time. He was the man for Bonaparte who within 12 months made him deputy director of fortifications. He returned from Egypt as a brigadier general and after commanding the engineers at the camp of St. Omer. He was appointed aide-de-camp to the emperor on March 7th, 1805. Divisional general on May 30th, 1807. The following year, he married Fanny Dillon, the daughter of General Arthur Dillon, who had been guillotined in 1794 during the terror in Lord Girardin de Montgerat, Madame de la Touche, by her first marriage. The Dillons belonged to the gentry of Catholic and Loyalist England. For a century, they had been in France, were owners of a regiment which bore their name and had with their blood countersigned all the triumphs of royalty during the 18th century. Arthur Dillon, who had fought in the revolution, was probably one of its unknown heroes. Perhaps it is to him that unbiased history will give the palm for saving France from invasion. Fanny Dillon had a half sister who married Monsieur de la Tour Dupin. Prefect of the Empire, one of the negotiators at Vienna, and one of those who put Napoleon under the ban of the nations. She had a half brother, Monsieur de la Touche, and a sister who married the Duke of Fitzjames. No one was a more confirmed royalist than the latter. Grandmother, the Empress, the widowed Madame. Dylan had received two pensions from the emperor, one of 5,000 francs from the public treasury and a further 9,000 from the privy purse. She formerly had dreadful quarrels with Madame de Boer and having taken away her husband and plotted the most vile intrigue against her, but Josephine, a good daughter, forgave her. For his marriage, the emperor gave his aide-de-camp, besides the 87,000 francs he had bestowed upon him previously, 200,000 francs capital, and the residence of La Jonquière, fully furnished, together with the park surrounding it, to the bride a dowry of 200,000 francs in shares in the Long Canal, diamonds to the value of 50,000 francs, and a trousseau costing 30,000 francs. Fanny Dillon, much of whose childhood was spent in England in an atmosphere exclusively Catholic and royalist, completely reconciled herself to the new regime on condition that her cousin arranged for her a marriage equal at least to those of Mademoiselle de Beauharnais and Mademoiselle Tasher. She had been betrothed to Alphonse Pignatelli, brother of the Comte de Fuente, but he died. Mention was made of Prince Aldebrandini, to whom Josephine gave her cousin, La Rochefoucauld, with so much money. Then and there was the Duke de Medina, Sidonia, even the Prince de Neuchâtel, and it was Prince Bernard de Saxe-Coburg. When the emperor, returning from Bayonne, learned that she would be nearly 22 years of age and thought that it was time she was settled, Bertrand loved her and had several times proposed to her only to be always refused. If he was an indifferent prey, he was worth more than a shadow. The emperor concerned himself in the matter as did Madame de la Tour du Pin, whom he had made wife of the prefect of Brussels. Josephine informed Fanny of this, and she burst into tears and returned in despair to Beauregard to the home of her cousin, Madame de Von Ney Osmond, who offered her hospitality. The following day, she returned to St. Cloud in the hope of moving the empress, and she was quite melted to tears when the emperor entered. She ventured to reproach him for deceiving her in her expectations and gradually became so excited that she flew into a passion and said to him, What, sire? Bertrand? Bertrand? imitator of the Pope by his mode of life? 
That is enough, Fanny, returned the emperor bluntly as he left the room. The example she quoted from the fable, the monkey and the leopard, was scarcely well timed. If the emperor did a lot for these grandparents of Josephine, whose whims, spirits, and hilarity might create a good humor in him, this epigram, directed against one of its generals and a personal friend, offended him. Supposing the names of those not of the nobility were made of laughing stock, Josephine spoke to her of the grand places her husband would have, and of the title of duke with which the emperor could not fail to invest him in short she prevailed upon fanny without much trouble the latter little appreciating the delight of being a daughter and living as a companion to madame de Brun. the wedding took place at saint Lou at the palace of queen orton's and everything went off wonderfully well fanny was thenceforth very happy with a husband whose every concern was her wishes and those of her mother brother and all her relations more happy still with the grand life with the Hotel Rue Neuve de Luxembourg, number 14, with the visits to other residences, with the fashionable toilettes, she took Chez Le Roy, which were becoming to her graceful carriage, to the aristocratic slenderness of her body, to her little head on a very long neck, her head contrasting the blackness of her eyes with the fairness of her hair. At Vienna, during the armistice, after the campaign of 1809, she rejoined her husband, who had received a great an eagle of the legion for the crossing of the danube she participated in his reward at croatia she played a splendid part in the festivities and celebrations of the austrian marriage and thought that the archduchess also had found her bertrand she made an engineering trip to holland and on april 9th 1811 count bertrand was appointed governor general of the illyrian provinces which ranked him among the dignitaries ah there you are, Countess Fanny, said the Emperor. You are going down to succeed King Marmont. Have you a good cook? Sire, replied Madame Bertrand, I have with me here in my service one who boasts a great reputation. That is not enough, retorted the Emperor. You must have two with a good chef and a good steward, and you will be drawn by six horses. Do you hear, Madame Governess? And it was so.